Welcome to Sausage on a Fork, a podcast dedicated to the UK's longest-running children's drama programme, Grange Hill. My name's Neil, and in each episode, I'll interview a former cast member about their life before, during and after their time on the programme. Okay, welcome to the next episode of Sausage on a Fork, and I am absolutely delighted to say that I have been joined by none other than Chris Jory, who played Mr Lawrence Knowles. Chris, welcome to Sausage on a Fork. Lovely to be here. Brilliant. Thanks for inviting me. No, not at all, not at all. Okay, so what we'll do, Chris, is we'll start the way we start every episode, and if you can tell us how you got into acting. Well, um, it's quite simple, really. Um, it's okay. I was at a grammar school in... Um, I'm from Coventry, Right. And when I was nine, my parents moved to Kenilworth, which is just outside. And I then went to the grammar school in Leamington. Right. And it was an all-boys grammar school. And so one of the big concerns for all of us was meeting girls. That's okay. And somebody told me that there was this youth theatre uh-huh. in Kenilworth, where I'm from, that there was a youth theatre there. And there were loads of birds there. (laughs) Brilliant, okay. So I went, right, okay. So me and two other pals went along. uh, One, and it was on a Thursday night. So we went on on Thursday night, and this particular Thursday, just coincidentally, we didn't know this until we got there. But this particular Thursday, they were auditioning for the big show. They did one big show a year. The youth theatre. They were given the the theatre for a week. Uh-huh. And they, we did one show a year. And um, they were auditioning for that show. Right. And we were there and we auditioned. We didn't know what we were doing, really. We auditioned and we got the part. It's okay. And I got a part. And uh, the, the character was called First Guard. Right. Okay. <laughs> and, my, and my two pals who had gone with me got Second Guard and Third Guard. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, they didn't have any lines, but I had quite a lot of lines, right. although I was only called first guard. Uh, and I was sort of comedy idiot guard, really. It was it was a production of uh, Jean Henri's Antigone, which was an adaption of a Greek classic. Uh-huh. And anyhow, we did the show. Uh, at this time, I wanted to be a vet. Right. And being involved in theatre or anything had never even occurred to me. Uh-huh. And um, we did it, and the local paper, the Coventry Evening Telegraph, came to see it, and I stole all the reviews. Brilliant. <laughs> they, the guys who played Antigone and uh, Crayon, the big main characters, who were a few years older than me, were infurious. <laughs> they could barely talk to me after this. Right. Um, and it completely took me, you know, I... I hadn't intended this. I'd only gone there because there were girls there. Oh, right. and there were girls there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Because in fact, I'm still married to one of them. Oh, right. Brilliant. So um, so, so that's how I started. And then, you know, because I got this response, it was the first time, and this is common to almost all actors you speak to, it was the first time that I got a sort of unqualified positive response to something right. I'd done. Yeah. Uh, and so I started thinking, well, is there something in this? Uh-huh. And when it became clear to me that I was never going to get the four science A-levels that I needed in order to go to veterinary college, and right. there was no fecking chance for that, <laughs> um, as soon as I realised that, I changed at the end of the Halfway through the first term of the sixth form, I changed all my courses from sciences to arts. Right. And then it became, oh, well, now maybe I could do something with all that, whatever that acting thing is. Yeah. Brilliant. And so I then started applying and then eventually went to did summer at university. Uh-huh. But again, I, I didn't really want to act. I wanted to direct. I, I I like the yeah. idea. I like the idea of putting shows together. Uh-huh. That's what I liked. 
And um, so I went to Hull University right. because at the time, this was 1975, 1976, right. there were only five universities that did drama in the country. Right, okay. And Hull was one of them. And the reason I went to Hull was because they had a television studio. Right. <laughs> and they did television modules in television production, which nowhere else in the country did at the time. Oh, right. Okay. So I went there because of that. Uh -huh. And then I had three fantastic years, loved it, loved Hull, still do, go back quite a lot. Right. And um, significant to Grange Hill and later my career, two things happened. Firstly, there was a company there called Hull Truck. Right. Um, which became very successful later and and um through through the, the, the whole truck used to do all their um they didn't have a theater so they used to use the university's theater to do their dress rehearsals and lighting rigs and all of that uh -huh. and and in return for that the director a guy called Mike Bradwell would meet people right and over the years, he hired quite a few uh, for whole truck. Uh -huh. And um, I wasn't one of them initially in the first year. And I left and I eventually got a, a, an acting job in Lincolnshire Roadshow. Right. Based in Lincoln, playing Freddie Fluoride <laughs> in Freddie Fluoride and the um, gum disease monster, Gingivitis. Right, okay. And, and, <laughs> A great show, a classic of its. Well, kind. you know, title character, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I went, uh, and I went to, um, and while I was there, I got this call from this guy called Mike Bradwell, and he said, "Do you want to be in a whole truck show?" And I said, "Fucking hell, yeah, too <laughs> right, I did." I, and I then went, left Lincoln, went back to Hull, joined Hull Truck. And then over the years, I did many shows. Great. But the other thing about Hull that was crucial to Grange Hill was the fact that uh, while I was there, an ex-student had um, uh, uh, an ex-student had become a lecturer there. Uh -huh. And for the three years I was there, he was lecturing. And his name was Anthony Mingella. Wow, right. And Anthony Mingella who subsequently made the English patient and won eight Oscars and all the rest of it. Yeah. But he left and became a script editor at the BBC. Yeah. His first job was script edi editing a thing called Maybury. Uh -huh. And he got me a tiny little part in that, which was my first uh, tele acting. Yeah. Job. And then he put me up for the part of Mr. Knowles uh -huh. in Grange Hill. Right. Brilliant. And I got that. And I got it. Brilliant. But, but obviously, Mr. Knowles was an incompetent teacher. That yeah. was what, <laughs> that's what the story was about. You know, the story yeah. was about the classic useless um, trainee teacher who comes in and everybody... Yeah. You know... But, but if, if, can, I just say, can, I, can I just take you back to Mabry there? Because... When I was reading up on yourself for this, you got to work with like with Patrick Stewart was in that. Uh, did you get to work yeah, with Patrick yeah. Stewart? You know, no, uh, right, no, okay. I, 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 well, I might have done actually. Uh huh. I can never. The, the guy who I did my scenes with was very famous, uh, sort of comedy actor, and I can never remember his name. Right. Which is just as well because I didn't like him very much. <laughs> right, it's okay. I was going to look him up then, <laughs> but uh, I was yeah. <laughs> And um, he was not very nice to me because I, you know, it's the very first job. I didn't know yeah. what the hell I was doing. Yeah. Uh, with you know, I'd never done any actor training because uh -huh. drama you didn't do that. You just did shows. Right. Uh, and so I didn't do any. I've never done never done any acting training, let alone screen acting training right. i'd heard that you should do uh, you know you shouldn't do very much on camera right. i'd heard that so i didn't do anything right okay and, look, and, the, and when i saw the episode of maybury you know and like 
people came round to the house. It was the first time I was on. T- you know, I'm a plumber's son from Coventry. I, you know, <laughs> like this was like shit. I'm on the telly, and um, people came round and we watched it, and I looked like I was on, you know, Mogadon or something. I mean, because <laughs> I wasn't doing anything. Right, I see. Yeah, and I said bollocks to that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Again. So luckily, I'd done that by the time I got um, when I came. Yeah, when we did the following year. We did um, the first episode. Uh huh. Grange Hill. I yeah. Did. No, I mean the thing about y- your time in Grange Hill. Am I right? In the first, the first series you were in, which was series six, you were only in the one episode. Yeah, I remember. But that episode. It was all about Mr. Knowles, wasn't it? It wasn't like, you know, yeah. a, a little bit. You were just in it here and there. It was all about your episode. And I just think that's really great for, like, coming in and just having that whole episode. Just, I mean, that must have been great as well. Like, huh. Were you aware of Grange Hill? Did yeah, you know yeah. What Christ, it, what yeah. Was, Everyone like? was aware of it. I mean, I'd, I'd actually been at university when it started, so I right. wasn't, right, okay. you know, <laughs> I wasn't the generation of people who grew up with it, but my sister was. My younger sister's 11 years younger than me. Oh, right. Okay. So when I got it, she was absolutely, she was at primary school and she was like, oh, my <laughs> brother's in Grange Hill. And I said to her, yeah, I wouldn't brag about it too much. You haven't seen the character. <laughs> because, you know, shit. Because, um, I mean, you're saying that about the character. He was a probationary teacher and he had, no control did he over the class when he was first yeah. in it. He looked, he looked terrified. The first time you see Mr. Knowles, you look at him, and he he looks like he's thinking, "What the hell am I doing here?" Like you know, he's got absolutely no control. Before before I went to Hull, I did a year at a teach training college, right? <laughs> and um, I've got every sympathy with Mr. Knowles. You know, <laughs> I mean, horrific. The, the thing that stood out about him first of all was his accent. Now, you've got a slight twang there. You know, obviously, you're born in the middle and you're going to have that twang. But where did where did the, the full accent come from? Was, 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 was that written in the script? I don't know. I can't remember. The director, right. Alistair, uh-huh. um, I'm always, whenever I talk about Grange Hill, I talk about Alistair because he was very very influential i only did this one episode with him i never worked with him on grain jill again right uh, on that and i never worked on anything else with him so i only knew him for the two weeks that we did this uh-huh. but he was incredibly influential he was a very kind man and a really good director and he uh he talked to me a lot about you know he gave me a lot of help and uh guidance and a lot of leeway as well uh-huh you know, he he let me do things, you know, the stupid walk and the accent <laughs> and all of that. Now, I can't remember whether they were in the script right. or not, or whether uh-huh. we or whether they came about through discussion or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember, to be honest. Right. But obviously they became such defining characteristics of. I mean, I mean, I, th- I think it's really good because obviously he had no control. I know the, the accents and the walk added to that because the kids took the mick out of Mr. Knowles. And there's just that scene where it just the class just descends into pandemonium. Now, every everyone had a teacher like that at some point in their lives. You know, certainly well, certainly yeah. when I was at school, there was always one teacher who, yeah. who just had no control. And I just think that, you know, obviously... Phil Redmond writing it originally, he that that's what he did, didn't he? You know, he was doing teaching. So he's obviously gone from experiences as well. And you know, obviously you had Anthony Mangella on, on uh, you know working as the script editor as well, which is fantastic as well. Now, yeah, there's the bit where you know the, the class did descend into pandemonium and Mr. Smart comes in shouting at everyone because he didn't realize there was a teacher in the room, which I love yeah. as well. Now, yeah. <laughs> There's a bit there in, in that episode where he, Mr. Knowles goes out to get his lunch or get some shopping and the girls follow him and they're copying his walk. And like you say, you don't know where the walk, if the walk was in the script, but again, it added to the character. Now, well, while we're talking, I've just had a memory about where that came from, that actually what was in the script was it said the girls mimic his walk. 
right, okay. <laughs> and so, although it wasn't said anywhere else that he walks funny, right. girls had to mimic something. Uh-huh. So we had to come up with something that the girls could mimic. Right. Okay, brilliant. So we came up with that. Right, okay. Now, every few weeks when there's going to be a new episode of of the podcast, I, I give out clues, I give out picture clues to who it's going to be. And the first person to guess who it's going to be gets to ask the next guest a question about their time on Grange Hill. And the person that's asking the question this time is Wayne Rogers. Now, Wayne is a massive Grange Hill fan. He's a, an admin on Facebook of, of a couple of the Grange Hill groups as well. So, big shout out to Wayne because he does so much at keeping the memory of Grange Hill alive. And Wayne's question is, when the girls were following you down the street, what was it like filming it? Well, you know, was it fun to film? Um, it was. It was. It, Grange Hill was where I, to the extent that I ever did, learnt to act on camera because coming back the next year and then the following, it was like um, being a regular in something is very, very different than being a guest. Turning yes. up and doing one episode is yeah. can be quite an unpleasant experience. Uh-huh. Um, but being in it regularly, and as you say... Because the episode was all about Mr. Now, uh, Mr. Knowles, it was like I was the lead in the episode. Yeah. And in Grange Hill, the adults actually aren't. Right, yeah. By its nature, the kids are the important characters. That's what the show's about. Yeah. So it was a very it was an unusual set of circumstances. But yes, it was great fun. I mean, um I had when I was at university, uh I always played you know, punk rockers and skinheads and right. what have you. And um, when I went to Hull Truck, Mike Bradwell somehow saw the inner nerd in me <laughs> and okay. um, and fuck bloody well cast me in these <laughs> nerd roles. And then that's it, really. I was fucked. <laughs> All my acting career, I played these nerdy nerds. And um, so... There was a there was a sort of element of you don't want to be perceived like that, obviously. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you know, I was in my early twenties, I don't want to be perceived as a as a nerdy character. Yeah. But I had enough sense to separate myself from the character, you uh-huh. know. Yeah. But I mean the 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 standout memory I have of filming, we filmed the exteriors in Hammersmith where the school was. Uh-huh. So we'd done some school stuff and then we went to do the following, those scenes where they were following, you know, and it yeah. and we stopped following me <laughs> and all of that. And um, we, w- we were filming on a street and there was a guy called Phil who was the one of the runners. And he subsequently became my first assistant when I was directing EastEnders. Right. Uh, and we became good pals. And But Phil was there. And um, we were in the middle of a take and a Scottish guy came down the street towards him who was legless. (laughs) And he came down the street towards Phil and Phil's trying to say, shh. (laughs) And, you know, Phil's very um, inexperienced himself, you know, and was only Uh 21, 22 himself. And he was, you know, very eager to please the production managers and the first assistant and everything yeah. else. So he put his hand on his chest to yeah. say, don't go past. So they call cut and the bloke started effing and being and all the rest of it. <laughs> and the first assistant came over and he was sent on his way. And then we were doing another take. And about 15 minutes later, this bloke came back, walked straight through the scene and Phil and knocked him out. Oh no! So he'd obviously gone off in his drunken stupor, full of resentment. And I've fucking no, I've been yeah. <laughs> no one's gonna push me a bit. I'm gonna fucking show these parts. Oh yeah! And he came back. Bam! Phil's punk. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we all laughed our asses off. But uh, which wasn't very politically correct or whatever. But it was. 
hilarious, really. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where to go now. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. you know, you get made, brutality. You know, the yeah. brutality of the streets. <laughs> the brutality of the streets when you're filming. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no one ever said Craig Jill was going to be uh, dangerous, did they? And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, you know, though, carrying on in that episode, there's a bit where, you know, he, he then supports the idea of flexi time and, and some of the kids start coming around from a bit. You know, he he helps Julie. He gives Julie an idea for her homework. He, he's, she's got to write about someone yeah. working in a factory or a foundry because he was a history teacher. And... Somebody working in a factory or a foundry at the start of the century, and she doesn't know what to do. So he actually says to her, "Why don't you introduce a foreman who you and the other ladies make fun of? You know, and that sort of gives it. You know, she sort of realised. Hang on, we've been making fun of you there. You know, maybe we shouldn't be. Because, but but then it also gives yeah. her the idea that she can use her real life, and I really like that. The fact that even though these kids yeah. have been horrible to him and they're just ruthless with him, he's still on their side." You know, he still wants to. He still wants to have the best for him. And then Zamo hears that there's going to be an inspector coming to inspect Mister Knowles. It's the fourth time or something that he's been in. So, yeah. so they they convince the class, you know, to be quiet and to just behave and and do everything right for Mister Knowles. And even though Annette still tries to have a go, he makes sure she cuts it out and behaves. And he passes the inspection. Yeah. Him. And then the episode ends, and we think that's yeah. it for Mister Knowles. Yeah. Um, so did, did, you, I. did you? Yeah, did, I was going to say. Did you think that was it? Yeah, but then obviously the he, school obvious. The school, the whole episode was about the guy being incompetent. So the school <laughs> obviously isn't going to employ him. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's that was fantastic and brilliant, and I've got a really good credit and a bit of show reel and all the rest. And um, and then bugger me, they said, "Do you want to come back <laughs> next year?" I'm like, "Wow, what yeah. school?" But I mean, it was a slightly different Mr. Knowles. He seemed more confident, you know. He had yeah. more, he had more control. Well, um, they, they they couldn't just, you know, there's got to be a level of credibility. The school yeah. hired him, so the the school must have seen something in him. So yeah. he's got to, he can't, you can't play the incompetence thing all yeah. the time because, you know. Yeah, I am. Um... And you know, because we see that right from the start, where he's pulling a net on the fact that she is wearing jewellery and she shouldn't be, and, and and she accepts that, you know, and she 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 gets rid of it, like even though there's an no, I'll say, but she still, you know, she she she, she does get on yeah, with yeah. it, like, and I think that that's really good to to show that. And then there was the sponsored walk episode. You were involved on a few out a, a few. You know, outside broadcasts there. Yeah. Like, so you got the um, location. Yeah, no, should, that was great. Location, I, I should we, say. When we went up to Yorkshire to do the, uh, not the sponsored, was it? No, orienteering. It was, orienteering, yeah. We went to Yorkshire to do the orienteering. Yeah. And, of course, I mean, I went to, I've been, I've only been to two Grange Hill conventions right. in my years. And we went to one not long ago, about yeah. six weeks ago, or okay. whenever it was. And um, Annette Furman was there. And uh, it was just extraordinary because, you know, they were little teenage girls when I yeah. knew them. The last time I saw them, and now they're, you know, women in their 50s with the kids of their own. Yeah, One of them's got grandchildren. You know, it was <laughs> like, wow, this is really bizarre yeah but their memory of the orienteering one especially was massive yeah because of course it was like a genuine school trip because yeah. they all went to go away they all stayed in a hostel yeah so god knows what it was like in there I mean, <laughs> you know i imagine it was i wouldn't have liked to try to be in yeah. charge i'm sure um we were all just in hotel, you know. And yeah. Mingella came on that one. Right, okay. Uh, he came to that location, actually. Uh -huh. So he must have stayed on it for a couple of years, Mingella. Yeah. Uh, but a, Because him and Kenny McBain then went and did Morse. Right, okay, yeah. Because Kenny McBain was the producer and directed a few episodes as well. Yeah. And um, and. They came up and we all went out for a meal that night and and we were we were in a we went to a restaurant called the Box right. the Box Tree that was it uh -huh. um 
the box tree. And this was in, you know, what, 83, 84, maybe 83? Yeah. And Nouvelle Cuisine had just come in. Right, okay. And this place, the box tree, was very famous in Yorkshire. Uh -huh. um, and because it was, you know, a really high-end gourmet restaurant, but in the middle of nowhere in Yorkshire. Yeah. And it had been... I'd heard of it before, and I what didn't mix in those circles <laughs> particularly. It was very famous. Yeah. So we went to this bloody restaurant, and two things happened was, firstly, I discovered at the end of the meal that we were all paying for ourselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it cost me all of my exes for the entire week was spent on this bloody <laughs> meal. <laughs> and they sat down. They When you sat down... And they brought the plates out and they had like a metal cover over. Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah. They, all the waiters stood around in a circle and then as one, they lifted yeah. these things back to reveal this tiny <laughs> meal. And it cost me all of my expenses for the entire week for the meal. And I had chips on the way home. <laughs> I was bloody starving. Oh, the bastards. Oh, uh, brilliant. Gella could have paid. <laughs> producer. No, no. But on that, I'm just talk <laughs> talking about that audience here weekend, Mr. Knowles takes the lead on the on that, you know, with the audience here and for, to, to start with. Was that something you were experienced in at all? <laughs> right? No. So bit, obviously... No. Obviously, no, people can't see this. Can't. You want to see the face Chris has just pulled when I asked <laughs> yeah, yeah. that question. No. no, I can say. I mean, I've always been uh, quite outdoorsy. And, in fact, I knew the area around where we filmed it and where the box tree was, I knew quite well because I'd gone youth hosteling around there, you know, when I was a teenager. And I did, I did a lot of walking and uh, camping and... So I did a lot of that type of stuff. Uh -huh. or, orienteering involved running, and that was... You know, <laughs> right. you know, I've, 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 I've managed to avoid that most of my right. life, actually. That Because, like, as I say, you know, we took the lead. He was far more suited to it than Mr. Baxter was, which Mr. Baxter didn't like. And then, obviously, Mr. Baxter got injured, you know, stranded in the woods, and Mr. Knowles had to go looking for him with uh, Mr. Braithwaite, who was the man from the centre and Mr Knowles had to take charge and was getting involved in getting the, the police and the rescue party and it was good uh, you know we've mentioned a little bit that there was growth you know some development in Mr Knowles but it was good to see that sort of growth and development to Mr Knowles' character because yeah. we, tend, we, we usually saw that in the kids mm. and usually when there was a, a, a teacher character you know they that's what they were like they were set in the ways and that was it did you have any sort of, you know, input into the fact that no. Mr. Knowles' character would change? No. Right. No. No. Okay. You know, I was very young. I was very inexperienced anyway. Yeah. Um, I was astounded to get those episodes in that second right. series. Yeah. Um, I still felt very much out of my depth. Right. You know, um, but as I say, doing those six episodes that second year yeah. gave me a real... I did by the end of it, know something about acting on camera, uh -huh. which I was then able to take into the other stuff that I did. Brilliant. And um, and I knew for sure that I, that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. And the other acting thing... Acting on camera. The other thing in that series that M Mr. Knowles was quite important with was the Annette Fairman story of a, being abused by a mum. At home because it was him that sort that found Annette when she was upset and it was because her bike had been nicked. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, he, he he got involved and he got got the police involved. But he also stopped a mm -hmm. fight between Annette and Faye when Annette had gone to Faye saying, well, you know, like the fact that Faye had revealed to a, another teacher what had happened. And mm -hmm. again, that's just Grange Hill, isn't it? You know, bringing those storylines in because a lot of kids might not have even yeah. realised that that sort of thing went on. You know, um, yeah. so it, it, just the fact that, you know, we say it all the time on, on this, the fact that it was so groundbreaking and it was so different for, for kids. It was like nothing kids had ever seen. Well, it you know, what we 
call the first golden era of t British television, which was sort of 55 to 85. Yeah. Roughly speaking, although actually it was sort of over. But, you know, Bleasdale was going on into the 80s. So yeah. seven, 55 to 85 is sort of, you know, the period that you would say. And, of course, yeah. social realism. British, you know, social realism was central to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, play for today's Ken Loach. All of that stuff had come out of that. Uh -huh. So what was unique and clever about what Phil did was he brought that idea, that aesthetic of uh -huh. social realism into children's television. Yeah. And that hadn't been done before. Yeah. And, you know, um, there were often genuine controversies yeah i mean grange hill generated lots of controversies you know people usually on the right wing saying the thing should be banned it's encouraging kids to do uh -huh. this that, and the other and you know they obviously had no idea you know i don't know where they'd gone to school but yes. clearly nowhere that I'd ever been because every I went to a grammar school for Christ's sake, and you know, we were locking teachers in cupboards for Christ's sake. Okay. Alone, you know, you know, a grammar school in Nemington Star, and yeah. we were locking teachers in cupboards. So you know what they were doing in, in inner city Hansworth. Christ knows what they were doing. <laughs> but so I don't know where these people went who were complaining about Grange Hill had gone to school. Yeah. I don't know what they were thinking. You know, oh. there was not there was nothing in the show that didn't ring true to me. Right. You yeah. know, and that was how it survived, really. Yeah. Because they were right, you know, they were on the money. Yeah. And you were also in one of Grangeel's most famous scenes, which is the end of term disco to celebrate this the merger of the schools. And it's yeah. went it's went through through by Spandau Ballet. It's Come played. on, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Mr. Mr. Smart and Mr. Howard are wanting to dance with Miss Gordon, but yeah. Miss Gordon sees the light and she grabs hold of Mr. Knowles. Yeah. Now, when Gary Hales was on, who played Nigel, um, he said it was like it was the first time Grange Hill had done a sort of a dad's army ending with it, like you have been watching. Um, yeah. And you're there with uh, Cara, Cara Wilson, wasn't it? Played yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just think that was, you know, not only were you in Grange Hill, but to have that like that that special sort of the, the credit scene as well and to be in yeah yeah to be in that right. scene as well like and of course every time I hear that song I'm like I'm in the Grange Hill disco <laughs> and it and it was a bit it was a bit like um it was a bit like a school disco because right. in the story they got um Susan Tully her character came back for the school yeah. disco, but she'd actually left the year before. Uh -huh. So I never actually worked with Susan. Right. She was she was still in the show when I did that first episode, but of uh -huh. course she, I, she wasn't in the episode that I yeah. did that first year. And then she left that year. Yeah. So when we did the disco, she came back, uh -huh. which of course was what people do at school discos. Yeah. So, <laughs> It was very weird because they were all like, "Oh, hello, hello," and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was very weird. It was, it was a strange, uh, yeah, wonderfully strange. Yeah, um, in general, experience. in general, how did you find the relationship between the kids and the adults? Um, a, a, a lot of the adults were quite resentful. Right. The actors. Right. Um, and you hear, you know, this is something over the years I've come across a lot because right. if you're, if you're a regular, uh -huh. yeah, but you're not a lead, yeah, you know, you do a lot of hanging about, you yeah. do a lot of coming in, saying four lines, right. and then bogging off, yeah, and it's not very satisfying, right, and you know, so there's a lot of talk about you know i mean it would be much better if they develop my character to yeah. this and this now i i think i because i was you know 
still very young myself, uh-huh. I understood very clearly that the show was about the kids. Right, I get you. And the adults are only there to facilitate the stories about the kids. Right, yeah. You know, like you say, the Annette Furman story is the story. Yeah. Mr. Knowles is just a folk, you know, uh, an adult person who can, who can, you know, bring about the end of the story. You yeah. know, the story isn't about Mr. Knowles. Yeah. And, of course, the stories very rarely were, as you say. You know, for me, it was fantastic because it was like doing a play for today or something. Yeah. Because you, you know, you sort of were the main character. Yeah. After that, that wasn't the case. You know, you're not, you're not, the characters aren't driving the plot. Yeah. You're just facilitating the actual uh, yeah. story, which is the kid's story. Yeah. And I always understood that. So I was never resentful about that. I was just very glad to be doing it and having a ball. Yeah, but there were some rumblings and moanings, you know. <laughs> it's okay. You know, people need the money. Yeah, <laughs> they need the gig, but you know, they don't perhaps like the fact that some fifteen-year-old's got the main storyline. You know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that. Yeah, yeah. So then that was the end of series seven, and it was the end of your time on Green Chill. Was that your decision or the production decision? I've thought about that in in the in the in the uh, when I'm doing the conventions, and to yeah. be honest, I can't remember. Right. I doubt if it was my decision. Uh huh. I can't imagine that I would have, yeah. in my life or career I don't want to do any more. Yeah. I can't imagine that I would have said that. Uh-huh. I enjoyed doing it very much. As I say, doing six episodes gave me enough of a connection with it to really understand what filming was about. Right. I was, you know, I doubt very much I would have said no. I'm Because I, w- I was doing a theatre show at the time um, called Hard Feelings, another show with Mike Bradwell. It wasn't the whole truck, but it was with Mike Bradwell. Right. And that did a tour... And then play for today about it. So it may have been that I wasn't actually available when they needed me to be available. Right, I get you. I get. But I can't remember. I don't remember that conversation if there was one. Right. Okay. So then, so then you left, and obviously you obviously continued acting there because you've said you know you you knew that that was what you wanted to do, and 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 the fact that Granger had had sort of heightened that you know and and let you into screen acting. As well, and you did. You, when I was looking at your CV, I I, I apologise. I do use IMDb, which I know isn't the most the most accurate. But I, but when I looked at your CV, and you were in like some just like if it, if you give a list of British programmes, like you were in like so many of them. And but what I did like was the, you were in Drama Rama. You did an episode of Drama Rama on was it Yorkshire Television? What I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, Drama Rama was one of those programmes I sort of dipped in and out of. Because it always terrified me. <laughs> Every time I watched it, it was always a scary episode. <laughs> and then when I watched it, like, and even when I've watched some back now on YouTube as an adult, I think, Jesus Christ, the kids were watching this. Just that, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What's your fancy watching while you're eating your spaghetti on toast? You know what I mean? And then, and then drama oh, yeah. it was there, like, but you were yeah. also, um, you know, you've mentioned you played the play for today, where you played Baz in that one, and mm. then, you know, a very peculiar practice. But you were in three episodes of Doctor Who, playing it, and I love the fact that your character was called Deadbeat. Um, yeah. Now, do- I I have to say this: Doctor Who is something I I never got into, and I know it's massive, and I know it's I know it's tremendous, but it's just something I never got into. And when when you're asked to be in a program like that, similarly to you know Grange Hill, that must be tremendous as an actor, you know, to to get a part in. Well, like I mean, it wasn't cool by then. Right. Uh, you know, and they pulled it the following season. I think they did one more season uh, uh-huh. and then pulled it. Uh, so it wasn't cool in right. the way that it is now. Uh-huh. Uh, and it had been earlier, it had been cool. But yeah. by then it wasn't cool. Um, I mean, talk about my memory is so shit because <laughs> it turns out that when Sylvester got it, yeah, I was interviewed to be Doctor Who. All oh, right. 
And I had no memory of this. I found, <laughs> this, okay. out con- I found this out at a convention in Sheffield last year. They said, well, you were, you've... And, that, and then somebody said, we've got the audition tape. And I'm like, what the... <laughs> I got, what? I was up for Doctor Who? Wow. And, but uh, apparently I was. That was amazing. But... Uh, uh, it was one that was a fantastic gig. I loved it, and yeah. uh, you know, I do a couple of three conventions a year, Doctor Who conventions. So to meet everybody's fantastic. Um, it was a really fantastic job, and it was quite special because uh, we sort of had to do it twice because there was asbestos in the studio, right? Uh, and they closed it down, and we had to do it in a tent at Elstree, right? So it became quite a Thing. it went on for months and months and months yeah. and um i got to know the people quite well the cast and it was great fantastic gig fantastic yeah, yeah. And as you say you know and i say it every time I, i'm a doctor who convention to be part of this thing is you know fantastic yeah and then you were also in something called stay lucky now when i looked at that the cast it's one of the most 80s casts of a program yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. ever seen, you know, Dennis yeah. Waterman, Jan Francis, and then yeah. it's just it's it's one of the most eighties programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's ever been made. I just love that. Like I can't remember who else was in it, but it was just, if you if you look at the cast list, you wow, well, oh, yeah. you know, it's just yeah, just yeah, no, no, I get it. <laughs> yeah. so but I, I had done, I had done, I we did the first series of Lovejoy in nineteen eighty five, right, and then they cancelled the show. Right. But after 85, between 85 and 90, because Lovejoy came back in 1990, and in those five years, almost everything I did, acting-wise, was with people who had done that first series. So the Doctor Who was directed by a guy who I'd met on Lovejoy, who was a first assistant on Lovejoy. Uh Um, David Reynolds was a director on Lovejoy, and then he directed Stay Lucky. Right. And... That was a a tricky one because uh, I I used to do a lot of accents, right? Yeah, and I could do quite a good Geordie accent, which is right. very difficult to do. Yeah, and the character was Geordie, right? And the guy who'd been the producer, the main producer of um Lovejoy uh-huh. knew I could do a Geordie accent from you know all the chit chat in the bar. Yeah. You know, <laughs> messing about in the bar. Yeah. And he knew I could do a Geordie accent. And and David Reynolds said to, to him, you know, we can't find anybody to do this character. And he said, Well, Chris Geordie can do a fantastic Geordie accent. So I went to meet David and read it as a Geordie and he said, Great, we want you to do it. I went, oh and fantastic. Yes. And then we went up to Yorkshire and did the first read through. And at the first coffee break, um, Dennis went off with David and de- they came back. Anyway, they went away for about 20 minutes and there was a bit of <laughs> going on. And they came back and they said, listen, as it's set in Leeds, um, maybe you should do a Yorkshire accent. <laughs> And I think what was actually going on was to sustain to to do a Geordie accent in a joke is yeah. one thing, but to sustain it over an episode is yeah. a different ball game. Yeah. And they, I've done three weeks rehearsing and working on it in the Geordie, but obviously, you know, it obviously didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I did, then did it as a as a Yorkshire. Huh. And then Lovejoy came back, so I didn't go back to Stay Lucky. Right. I went back to Lovejoy, which allowed them then to get a Geordie actress in to do sort of part of doing right. Stay Lucky, because Stay Lucky ran right. for another six years, I think. Right, so okay. Five years. So then, so then we, 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 you know, we, we should talk about Lovejoy, because obviously you were in there for so long. 55 episodes I've got on my list here, which is mm. a lot more than Mr. Knowles. Uh, in Grange Hill. Yeah. Now, yeah. obviously, you worked with Ian McShane, but you also worked with Dudley Sutton, who, 
I believe you'd worked with previously, or he was in those glory, glory days, you know, the yeah. Tom Hotspur thing. Did you get to work with him in that one? No. Right. But I had been, I'd got a tiny little part in that, but right. it was a great, and I only did one day on it, but it was right. a great day because it was at Spurs. Yeah. And I was playing a journalist uh-huh. and we were sat in the journalist box. Right. In the actual one at Spurs. Right. With all real journalists. Brilliant. And the most amazing thing about it was that the journalists, the real football journalists, didn't stop talking about football for a f***ing second from (laughs) 7 o'clock in the morning when we all arrived for makeup to when we left at 7 o'clock at night. They did not stop talking about football. I didn't know there was that much shit to be said about football. (laughs) Um. It was hilarious. And Dudley was playing. Dudley did a scene just behind me. Uh And, uh, you know, we never even spoke. Right. On that gig. But I was very aware it was Dudley Sutton. You know, it's Dudley Sutton. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but it was later, you know, then when we did um, when we did Love Joe, the first scene. I mean, uh... Love, Love Joe is one of those things, as you say, it was on first, you know, in, in the mid 80s. I was only, well, I was only probably 10, 11, so I wouldn't have been watching it then. And and by the time it came, came around again from, you know, the, the 90s, I believe it was a Sunday night program. And Sunday nights, I was usually doing my own work, or by the time it had finished it, in the pub. So it was one of those programs I never really watched. But I assume that, that those three characters, Love Joy and Tinker and, and Eric, were, you know, your three main sorts of characters did you, did well, you get... the, 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 there were four right. just there was lady jane Phyllis oh, right. yeah. and those four were the main were the four yeah. main regulars there was also a guy called malcolm tierney who played a character called charlie gimbert but he wasn't in all the series right but when he was he was the bad guy right and the five of us were very very close i mean uh-huh. dudley became my best mate right um, he died a few years ago, and I miss him. You know, I think about yeah. him all the time. He was a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. Yeah. And Malcolm. Uh-huh. And, uh, um, you know, they became friends for life. It was amazing. And, yeah. uh, you know, the memories of those years are just laughing. Yeah. I mean, we just laughed and laughed and laughed. It was hilarious, really. And, and do you speak to, do you ever speak to Ian McShane? Like, Ever... Yeah, I mean, I do, and he's been very, very, because I'm, uh, I've got an acting agent, but I don't really act anymore. I'm, right. I work behind the camera now, yeah. and have done for many years, uh-huh. and um, I've got some projects in America, and McShane's been very, very central, right, to to helping me, uh-huh. you know, make contacts yeah. in LA, so. Yeah, we we uh, in fact, I had to email him about something earlier on, right? Okay, so hey, he's replied, he's replied, all oh, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, you mentioned there that you that you you don't act as much anymore, and you tend to, you know, you've done a lot of uh, directing and producing, and again, you know, when you look at the list of things that you've directed, it's, it's you know, some of the, the top British programs, you know, the. Coronation Street, Crossroads, EastEnders, <laughs> the Royal Today Doctors. I think that some people might challenge your notion of Crossroads as one of the greatest <laughs> television programmes. Uh, um, I certainly would, but uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> I get like, what you're saying. But all, it's, it's all right. It's it's iconic. It's known, isn't it? You know, it's really well known. Yeah, yeah. You know, and now I have to ask this because. Obviously, you audition for if you audition for a part as an actor, and you get a recurring role, you tend to be you tend to do it a lot of episodes, a lot of episodes. But as a director, you you're not necessarily always guaranteed. For some of them, you might you might only do one or two episodes. Why why is that? Um, well, it varies from show to show. Right. Uh, on Lovejoy, um, there were a couple of directors who did every series. Uh huh. And did because the way if you're doing um hour long shows, yeah, uh, a director normally gets hired to do two episodes over four weeks, right? Shooting, 
and then there's pre-production. So we were directors on those shows who would do several blocks, they're called, Mm -hmm. several blocks in a season. And so they became regular, you know, they were known to us and what have you. And, um, uh, but when you're doing uh, soaps, yeah, um, the machine never stops. Yeah. Um, and the machine is moving all the time. So as a director, my main source of work was EastEnders. And uh-huh. for about 10 years, I was doing two or three blocks a year. Right. But you're never you're never hired for more than one block at a time. Right. I get you. Um, And a block on EastEnders then was seven weeks, Uh including pre-production, the shoot, and afterwards. Yeah. And um, so I think there was a time in television and I would argue it was probably part of the golden era of television where the directors were more regularly, you know, connected with shows. Yeah. And at that time in the 60s and 70s and certainly up to the early 80s, there were staff directors at the BBC. Yeah, right. So you, you right. would be employed by the BBC. Yeah. And when you weren't assigned to a show, you were still being paid. Right. Okay. You know, because you were on a... 52 yeah. week a year contract you were on a yeah. you were a bbc director and they assigned you yeah what you would be doing yeah um so you know i don't i think the reasons why uh it's come like it is now is basically because you know everybody and their wife wants to be the director right so you get you yeah yeah. So there's a lot of people. It's the same as acting. Right. Uh-huh. When I came into it, when I came into acting, we had what was called a post-entry closed shop, right. which meant that you had to have an equity card to get a job, and to get a uh, and to get an equity card, you had to have a job. Uh-huh. So okay. actors spent a lot of time faffing about trying to get an equity card, um, and of course, Thatcher. Um, ended the post entry closed shop, right? And because there was a post entry closed shop as a crew member, uh-huh. uh huh. So to be in Beck to the same thing applied. Um, and what that did actually was keep wages high, right? Because it meant the pool that they had to recruit from. Because you couldn't work at the BBC unless you had an equity card. Right. Yeah. So they couldn't just hire anybody. So uh-huh. I got my equity card through Hull Truck. A company like Hull Truck would be given, say, two or three equity cards a year. Uh-huh. And so they could hire actors like me who didn't have equity cards, and then they would give one of that year's equity cards to this new performer. All right. I get you. Then yeah. I could go and do Maybury because I'd got the equity card. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some people would go, oh, that's terrible. It's restricting who can work. I absolutely don't agree with that because uh-huh. what it meant was the wages were higher. You were treated better. Yeah. Because they had a limited pool from which they could hire. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, the consequences of getting rid of it are this. I did an episode of Casualty in 88, I think it was, after mm-hmm. I'd done Lovejoy. And Grange Hill. Uh-huh. And I got three grand for doing wow. it. Wow. In 1988. Wow. 1988, three grand was the equivalent of at least 10 grand now. Yeah. So when I got it, I could relax for like six months. Yeah. I could pay off my debts. It was fantastic. You know, it was because the three grand included, you know, the way they did it was you had shooting days, then you had the episode fee, blah, blah, blah. And I got repeats on that. Yeah. In 2017, I did an episode of Holby, Uh similar in size and weight and everything to that. Yeah. And I got 1,700 quid. Right. So it's over 30 years later and it's half money. Yeah. 
So that's what getting rid of the clothes shop did. Yeah. Yeah. It meant that everybody's money. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's made it very, very difficult. I, I mean, I don't know how somebody's a job in actor now. I don't know how you do that. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I mean, don't I don't know how. A lot I of job, a lot of job and actors have have other jobs, don't they? Well, they have to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know I did uh, in the early days. I had I did you know other jobs, uh -huh. and um, but after Lovejoy, I never did. Right. As an actor. Yeah. Because I could earn enough. Because I could do get three grand from a <laughs> casualty. You know. <laughs> I mean, on seventeen hundred quid, I'd have to be doing a casualty every month. Right, yeah. To earn, yeah, you know, less than the minimum, yeah, uh, the average wage, yeah. But then, you know, getting a telly was like, oh, and then if you got a commercial, shit, yeah, really in the money. But yeah. uh, you know, yeah. that's all gone now. Yeah, it's unfortunate, isn't it? Like as you say, like in the fact that 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 has gone. But yeah, I mean, you you are. Uh, not only a director, you you you're a producer as well, or you've produced uh, some things. Well, I had my I had my own company developing television, so right. yes, you could say that. Right, okay. um, and I became a producer director very briefly on EastEnders, but producing right. was never my. When I had my own company, I was when I was doing Lovejoy. I had a company called Picture That, and we developed television. Right. And, okay. Yeah. Uh, we did very, very well in development. And in fact, when I left Lovejoy, I got headhunted to go to the BBC to be development executive at Pebble Mill. All right. Uh, okay. in Birmingham to be the yeah. drama development executive there. And so that could have been a whole producing career. Uh -huh. But it wasn't for me. I wanted to be involved in more in the actual, what I regard as the, key creative roles uh -huh. um, and so i i left that job and then started writing for television right and, um and that's what i'm doing now right and, okay. um you know that for me is at the core of of it all really yeah so that's you know we didn't talk about the writer of that episode mr Knowles, but that was a great script yeah was a fabulous script yeah and um that's where it all starts you know yeah yeah and so you've done you know you're the acting the directing producing writing which, which do you prefer writing right um, i liked acting in the sense that um i always found acting easy right yeah. i found being an actor almost intolerable right okay <laughs> Because you've got to audition all the time. It's very humiliating. Often the auditioning process can be right. absolutely a in horror show of humiliation. Yeah. Um, you know, you're always short of money. You're desperate. So you're, you know, there's a mate of mine who's a job in actor. Very, he does very, very well. But every now and then he'll send me a photo of himself getting into a owl costume or something right, it's okay you know with this expression on his face of <laughs> you know, complete horror yeah at having to do this um so there's a lot of shit that's not great about it uh -huh. being an actor yeah but, and, and uh writing and directing can be just as stressful you know because yeah you're not working you're not being paid yeah um so it's no picnic there's, there's you know i keep wondering when the numbers of people wanting to enter the industry are going to drop off uh -huh. you know when word gets out that actually it's becking hard yeah and a lot of it you know I, I was looking at um somebody i know who's a sort of comedian and writer and what have you who's involved a lot with the Doctor Who scene. Uh -huh. And he was saying, God, I feel, you know, he was saying, he, he was pointing out he was having a bad time on uh, Facebook. Right. 
and I put my five pennies worth in and I said, the problem a lot with um, showbiz is success often doesn't feel like success. Right. Yeah. Because and, and that's why people in showbiz like awards so much. Uh huh. Yeah. Because, because they're clear demonstrations of success. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when I was doing Grange Hill, it didn't feel like success. No. The only job I did in that year, well, of those six episodes, was Grange Hill. Right. And six episodes, you know, six, seven, eight weeks. Yeah. So I've not, I've got no money. Yeah. You know, I'm bored. Yeah. And I'm frightened. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't feel, <laughs> you know, you look back now and you go, oh, and then you did Maybury, and then you did Great. Yeah, Maybury, yeah. And then you did Play for Today, and then you did yeah. Love Joy. And it all looks as if it's a nice laid out plan, doesn't it? It all looks yeah. lovely. And you went from one thing to the other. and Yeah. That's not what it fucking feels like. <laughs> right, okay. So I, I keep want I keep waiting for young people to start realizing and you know the word to get out, but it never does. It just goes on and on. Well maybe maybe it will now if people are listening to this, you know, you you, you may well have kick started something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've persuade enough people. Yeah. Yeah. So we are sort of coming towards the end, Chris. Of, yeah, uh, on that cheerful note. Of, uh, yeah. But <laughs> I've got some, some the last few questions I always ask, and they're all related to Grange Hill. Okay. Yes. So course, last yeah. last year, the, there was a story about a Grange Hill movie in the works. Phil Redmond's involved and, and stuff. Um, we haven't heard much about it since. But what do you think of the idea? Of a Grange Hill movie? Uh, I'd be astounded. Right. I don't know what the pitch would be. Uh huh. I don't know how you would pitch a Grange Hill movie. I mean, a 90 minute show set in a secondary school, I don't even know how you'd pitch that as a movie. <laughs> right. I mean, there's been a couple of shows now, Waterloo Road and what have you, set in secondary schools, uh-huh. and they've been very successful, but they're not re-pitching Grange Hill. You know, there is, you know, there's crossover of the territory, obviously, uh-huh. because of the nature. It hasn't, yeah. schools haven't changed that much. Uh, they're still, you know, effectively doing the same thing. Uh-huh. But I don't, I don't know what the pitch for a Grange Hill movie would be. I've no idea, right. um, and whether they mean movie, movie, or they, or they mean a ninety minute for telly. Yeah, because they're two different things. Yeah, but I don't know who would finance a Grange Hill movie. And uh-huh. as I say, I don't know what the pitch would do. I'd be a stat- It doesn't mean to say it isn't happening. Yeah, but and it might be that the pitch isn't. It's a Grange Hill movie that there's a great pitch. Yeah. That I haven't heard, but um, I can't imagine what that would be. Right. Okay. And if you were asked, would we see a return of Mr. Knowles? Uh, abs- of course. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. What do you think Mr. Knowles would be up to these days? Well, he, now he's retired and having a great time. On his <laughs> Excellent. And I should, ma- I should imagine he's running the local history society, wherever uh-huh. he is. Yeah, and uh, I imagine that he was married and had kids all along, and uh, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. All right, Mr. Knowles. So, other than Mr. Knowles, was there? A, did you have a particularly favourite character on Grange Hill? Um, yeah, I liked uh, Mr. Baxter. Right, and I liked it because he used to tell stories, terrible stories of all, you know, young thugs. Yeah. You know, buying into it and wanting to kick kick his head in all the time, right, and, him, okay. <laughs> and having to front it out all the time. He had a terrible time. Yeah, I mean, I think in one of those ones we did, he came in with a black eye, and he'd had something wow. of an estate in South London where you know some stupid bloody kids, yeah, thinking they're being tough, attacking a fictional character. You know, yeah. you're bloody idiots. Yeah, he's an actor, darling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so would you... I always liked him, but of course Mrs. McCluskey was 
you know, yeah. Mrs. McCluskey was the thing, you know, and she was a lovely, lovely woman as well. Yeah. So, yeah, got to be Mrs. McCluskey, I think. Yeah. So you just mentioned Mr. Mr. Baxter there as well. If you couldn't have played Mr. Knowles, would you have liked to have played Mr. Baxter? Then, or, or no. was there another another character you would have liked to have played? No, I was very happy playing Mr. Knowles. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So then the final question, Chris, is why do you think that there's still such affection for Grange Hill? Because um, for that generation who grew up watching it. Yeah. You know, because it's quite a specific demographic. Uh-huh. You know, I don't think there's a general, you know, there are people coming to Doctor Who now. Yeah. Who are in their 20s. Yeah. Who are looking at Doctor Who episodes from the 60s and the 70s. And, uh, and get, I doubt very much if that's the case with Grange Hill. Well, it's on, so basically, it's, it's on ITVX at the moment, Grange Hill. Yeah. So I well, know... that'll, we'll see what happens. But, yeah. But so... You know, the appeal of it or the impact of it is because of the age people were when they watched it. These yeah. things, you know, I'm a, the generation before. So as I say, I'd actually, before it start, what time, what year did it start? 78. 78. So I yeah. was at university in 78. Uh -huh. um, and I remember it starting and I remember the stuff and, uh, you know, it was a big deal. Uh -huh. But, you know, I was... In fact, I was quite old when I was at university anyway. So by 78, I was I was over 20, you know, right. I was yeah. 22 or whatever it was. So, you know, uh, I it, it, it wasn't my generation, mm -hmm. even then, Grange Hill. But so for my generation, there are shows, there was a thing that was shown in the 70s. They showed it at least once a year, which was a Dutch version of Robinson Crusoe. Right. And they showed it every year for about 10 years. Uh -huh. And the music, I'm off. Yeah. You know, the, I, if I hear the music to that, I'm off in the, you know, I'm back there. Yeah. Um, so I think that's why Grange Hill has, is so impactful, because for that 15 years, uh -huh. it was just so central yeah. to... Uh, and so much part of people's lives. Yeah. Um, and would have had such a big impact. Yeah. You know. Brilliant. Just before we go, can you just say the line for us as well, please? <laughs> Will you stop following me in it, Furman? <laughs> brilliant. Chris, it's been brilliant talking to you. Yeah, I've, I've loved it. Good. Um, it's, it's been great talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your experiences with us. Um, and for anyone who's listening, I'll speak to you next time. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye.